All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to today's Corona Developer Meeting. Uh, today, I basically have some status updates, not too much technical stuff because um, of visiting CERN and um, and OFC was last week, but uh, we'll, we'll get into it here. So agenda, announcements, and then status updates here. Okay, so announcements. The next dev meeting will be, I think, May 1st. Um, oh, I guess I need to adjust that. It's only going to be at 9 a.m. Nobody's been attending the, uh, the later session at 9 p.m., so I'm going to drop that one unless... Unless people want to attend, then you can make noise, um, you know, on the uh, on Zulip, and you know, maybe I can do that. But if nobody's going to show up, you know, it doesn't make sense to hold down that time. Um, the next switch meeting will be April tenth, and uh, I think Carlos has some interesting stuff to report about what he's been working on. So if the switch sounds interesting, nine hundred gigabits per second on a, a VU nine P, or I guess a VU thirty P, <laughs> uh, then you should tune in. Um. Let's see. So I got the, you know, the dates for the the rest of the meetings, um, here. You can put that on your calendar. And the switch meetings are going to be the second and fourth Wednesday of each month, um, at least for the time being. And there's a, a Google Calendar linked on the the wiki page if you want to add that to your calendar so you get reminders or whatever. Um, and I should also be sending the link around, you know, with all of the announcements. So that should be pretty straightforward. Okay. So. Moving on to the status updates. Um, like I said, not a lot of technical stuff. Um, when I was at CERN, we discussed, you know, how White Rabbit and Corundum might be able to be integrated. And part of that discussion was, you know, languages and licenses. And part of that was, you know, technical, how stuff's going to work. Um, so I'm going to discuss the languages and licenses first, and then we can get into some more technical details about, uh, you know, White Rabbit and Corundum. All right, so the first thing, um, potential license change to the, the CERN open hardware uh, weekly permissive or weekly reciprocal license. So when I first started putting together the open source Verilog code back in 2014 or whatever, um, I ended up using the MIT license because basically the GPL and the LGPL are, are not appropriate for hardware designs. I know there's some open source, you know, GPL and LGPL HDL, but I don't use any of it. And I think there's probably a number of people that are in the same boat that they don't use it because I it seems like it's impossible to satisfy the the GPL or the LGPL um, with open source HDL just due to what the licenses require. Um, so CERN took note of this and they created um, their open hardware licenses. And they have a couple different versions of those, but the most recent ones were released in 2020. Now we submitted uh, Corundum in, in 2019 to FCCM, so um, you know, we couldn't use the open hardware license for Corundum because it wasn't released yet. <laughs> um, but there's three different variants of the open hardware licenses. There's basically a strict version, which is more or less equivalent to the GPL. There's the weak version, which is more or less equivalent to the LGPL. And then there's the permissive license. Um, I'm not really sure exactly what the permissive license gets you over, you know, using the MIT or BSD or Apache 2 or something like that, um, aside from maybe a patents clause or something. Um, but the, uh, the other two versions are, you know, much more interesting. So just for a quick overview, the strict version basically means that all of the HDL in the project, uh, has to be released as open source, um, under the strict license. But there are a couple of carve outs for like vendor, um, related code. So for example, if you use a PCI express IP core in your design, even if you use just basically the hard IP, um, Xilinx usually has a bunch of wrapper code around that, that's HDL. Um, under the GPL, you would have to release that, but since you don't own the copyright, you can't release it, so you can't use GPL license um, HDL along with, you know, a Xilinx um, PCIe hard IP core, for example. But the, the strict CERN open hardware license actually has a carve out for that, which, you know, enables you to you know, basically release everything of, of your code and then just use the vendor code that gets integrated into the design. I think that this, the, the strict license does have a few potential drawbacks. Um, I was looking at the FAQ and it said that, you know, for say VLSI designs where you have a, a library of, um, you know, the, the standard cells, the cell library, um, the 
strict license would extend to that. So you basically can't use um, a strict license on a proprietary uh, flow, right? You know, TSMC wouldn't let you release their PDK as a, as a OHL license. So um, that basically leaves the, the weak as kind of the only reasonable option if, if you actually want people to be able to make use of it. Uh, so CERN seems to be using the weak license for most of their, um, you know, White Rabbit related code. So I'm thinking that it might make sense to do that for uh, for Corundum and the associated libraries as well. Um, and what I may do is end up leaving a few files under you know permissive license. So like the application template probably makes sense to leave that as a permissive license so you can just make a copy of it or maybe even something else. I don't know what that's like. I don't really care what the license is. You, you can do what you want. You can even attach your own license to it. Um, just because the idea is that you can make a copy of that and then drop your code into it. Um, the board level stuff, maybe would make sense to leave that something a little bit more uh, permissive, you know, in case you want to make a copy of it for a different, you know, proprietary board, something like that. Um, not sure. I haven't really thought through all of the aspects of this. Um, but I wanted to bring it up to the community and just say, you know, thinking about doing this, you know, are there... Any, you know, major objections, anything I, you know, haven't been or haven't thought through completely here, any potential pitfalls uh, associated with these licenses, you know, that would be a, a, a useful discussion to have. Um, I don't know if people, there's not too many people on the call right now, so I don't know if it makes sense to have a discussion about this now, but um, yeah. That's this is this is something that uh, I'm thinking about. I don't have a, a timeline for how this would how this would work, but um, yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm thinking about in terms of the uh, the licenses. And that would, if I used the the CERN Open Hardware license here, that would uh, dovetail nicely with the um, the White Rabbit code because they're using the CERN OHLW as well. So everything should should work together nicely. Um, the other thing that we discussed is um, was uh, languages. Right, so I've been using um, Verilog for um, all the libraries and for Quantum itself because at least back in 2014, um, the tool support for System Verilog wasn't very good. Now, obviously it's gotten better in the past few years and it's um, in open source tools. They actually support a number of different System Verilog features, at least at least in terms of, you know, Icarus Verilog and, uh, and Verilator. But Obviously, if you do have to support older devices like four, five, six series, some of the older um, Intel Altera devices, that could potentially be uh, could potentially be a problem. So, there's definitely a few things to uh, to think about in relation to you know potential, you know, not not exactly a rewrite, but a transfer over to uh, System Verilog. Um, <clears throat> it would definitely help simplify some of the interconnections between components. Um, inside a corundum, um, and really the power of using System Verilog, you you really only get that by transferring all of the libraries over to System Verilog as well, right? And like, it doesn't make sense to write corundum in System Verilog, but then use a, a Verilog AXI stream library. The whole point is, you know, to be able to use the interfaces and all of the System Verilog features. Um, so we'll have to obviously nail down all of the interfaces and whatnot um, to make sure everything is is well, we have a good base to build everything on top of. Um, but yeah, so it definitely makes sense to think about, you know, potential pitfalls with regards to this. Um, you know, from my point of view, it's primarily about, you know, legacy device support. Chronom doesn't support anything older than 7 Series, um, but some of the other code does. And I think some of the open source tools, you know, in terms of Yosis, don't necessarily support uh, System Verilog. So you know, that could potentially cause problems for other projects. Um, I'm not sure at this point. Um, I think probably the biggest concern from my end is it would be nice to be able to support some of these uh, older devices. But there's a couple options, right? We could drop support completely. Maybe there's a way we could use Vivado to do the synthesis and then hand it off to ISC for the place and route, maybe. Or maybe it makes sense to look at um, some sort of translation tool. So I know there's that SV2V uh, utility that somebody's been working on up on GitHub. I haven't really played around with that at all. I don't know if anybody is familiar with that, um, but that's potentially um, another possible path to keep support for these older devices. 
Um, but I guess the real question is, you know, how important is that really? Not sure. And also, if we're going to be rewriting everything, um, we'll probably have to create new repositories and whatnot. Question is, does it make sense to stick with, you know, get subcrees and make files? Or is there a different solution that's going to make more sense for, you know, bringing these different components together? I know there are a few kind of package management tools available for um, for HDL now that are relatively new. But, um, you know, I don't know necessarily what the advantages and disadvantages of those are. Honestly, one thing that I really like about subcrees is that everything is in the repository, right? You just clone the repository and you have everything. Or you download the archive and you have everything. Versus if you use git submodules, then you have to go in and you know, pull all of the individual submodule repositories, and if one of those moves, then that screws things up. Um, and the thing I like about the makefile flow is it's all very simple. You just have, you know, one makefile plus, you know, one um, kind of higher level component that has the, the implementation. Um, and there's there's not a lot of, you know, magic going on in the background. If you were to switch to some other tool that's more complicated, um, it might be harder to figure out, you know, what's going on and debug things. I don't know. Obviously, there's advantages and disadvantages to, to each approach. So I'm not sure if anybody has, you know, experience with alternative ways of organizing some of this stuff and um, putting the pieces together. Um, but it might be, that might be worth a, a discussion as well. But yeah, uh, I guess I forgot to mention um, the... Potential change to system Verilog is partially to, to help, um, you know, make Corundum a little bit better, but also partially to, you know, integrate some of the CERN code as well. This was something that we were discussing a bit uh, with the CERN folks is, okay, um, Corundum right now is all Verilog, and CERN, they write all their stuff in VHDL, and there really is no open source mixed language simulation support right now. So that makes it difficult to integrate, um, you know, the, the existing white rabbit code into Corundum because we don't really have a way of simulating it without using, you know, proprietary simulation tools. So it might make sense to consider moving everything to system Verilog, which would make it a lot easier to, uh, to integrate. Um, so the, they, they seem at least somewhat open to considering system Verilog. And if we move to system Verilog as well, that could make everything a lot easier to, uh, to deal with. So, uh, we'll see how things uh, how things pan out on this front, but I'd like to hear from from people if you have any any opinions one way or the other on this. I suspect it should be a pretty straightforward thing to change over because at least on the Corundum side, you know, the the syntax and whatnot is quite similar, so it's mainly a matter of defining the interfaces and swapping all that stuff out. Um, for the libraries, you know, same kind of thing. Obviously, the code that CERN has in VHDL, moving that over is going to be a little bit more complicated, but, you know, I'm not, not even sure if they're going to do that. We'll see. <clears throat> um, but at least this this change in isolation for Corundum, I think, could be, uh, could be significantly advantageous. Anyway, again, since we don't have, have, since we don't have too many people on the call right now, we can, you know, discuss this in more detail um, on Zulip or something, but... Uh, that's that's kind of my thoughts on on the matter at the moment. So, and we can move on to um, you know integrating White Rabbit into Corundum. So, for those of you who are not familiar, White Rabbit is a uh, high precision time synchronization protocol. It's basically a combination of synchronous Ethernet and PTP, um, and the idea is that it can provide time synchronization to the you know handful of picoseconds level. Um, PTP will get you to a few nanoseconds. White Rabbit gets you a few more orders of magnitude, but obviously, that's not particularly easy to do. And it was uh, it was good being able to talk to the CERN people and uh, just listen to all of the presentations at the White Rabbit uh, workshop because I now have a much much better understanding of you know some of the some of the considerations for a, a White Rabbit design and all of the uh, calibration and whatnot that has to go into actually making it work. Um, so yeah, to integrate White Rabbit functionality into Corundum, I think there's going to be a lot of stuff that needs to be uh, adjusted. So we've got the PTP time distribution components that work well enough for PTP, but they'll probably need to be adjusted 
uh, for White Rabbit to, to work. We're probably gonna have to make some adjustments to the Mac and the PCS logic as well, because we got to worry about things like the, the gearbox state for uh, for White Rabbit to work properly to get the uh, the delays correct. Um, and we're probably also going to need some sort of high precision timing I/O subsystem, right, for bringing in or generating, you know, one PPS signals and, and other timing related signals, um, at least to support, you know, calibration. Um, but if we can integrate White Rabbit into Corundum, we should be able to relatively easily add support for quite a few boards. So Corundum currently supports, I just counted up, about 30 different boards, which is quite a few, um, spanning multiple board vendors and multiple device families. So some of these boards look like they should be, well, I mean, obviously, once we get White Rabbit running, <laughs> that's going to be the hard part. Um, a good number of these boards look like, you know, they should be relatively easy to support. Other ones are going to require quite a bit of additional work. So um, what I'm going to do is go through some of the uh, considerations here in a little bit more detail. Um, and some of this I, I talked about in the, the talk that I gave at the, the White Rabbit um, uh, workshop two weeks ago. <laughs> but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail uh, today. Um, right. So I think what we can do is kind of break down what's needed for White Rabbit into a couple of categories here. So one of them is the uh, the device support. Um, the series Phi and Mac configuration is going to be very specific to the device family, right? Because each device family is going to have, um, the, it should be relatively consistent within a device family, but between different device families, you could have completely different serializers. Some of them might have hard Macs, some of them don't. Some of them have hard PCS logic, some of them don't. Um, in order to make White Rabbit work, it needs very deterministic latency. We're talking, you know, that the latency varies by hundreds of picoseconds. You know, you can't do time sync down to you know tens of picoseconds, um, and you need absolutely you know precision time stamping and um, internal you know time distribution for all this to work. So that means that we need to find you know sources of latency variance and mitigate those. Right, so gearbox logic, PCS, Mac, EMIB, you know anything that could affect latency, we're going to have to do some some tests and you know make sure that the latency is is understood, I suppose. <clears throat> um, and also, if there's you know any hard logic in there, the timestamping actually has to be implemented correctly because if it's not um, handling all of the associated corner cases and whatnot, then then that could be a problem. Because it's one thing if the latency is under control. Um, if the latency is under control, but the timestamps are not being captured correctly, then you got a problem. So I'm not sure for really any of the hard logic uh, Macs if that's going to work. That's going to have to be uh, investigated, you know, one at a time. Um, I suspect that the GTX, GTH, GTY transceivers on AMD Xilinx parts should work pretty well because those are what's currently being used in the White Rabbit switch. I think GTX on the uh, Zinc 7 series. Um, and they're working on a new switch which uses a Zinc uh, Ultra Scale Plus with the GTH transceivers. So hopefully uh, there won't be any major pitfalls with, uh, with making these things work. Other hardware is going to require a lot more characterization just to you know, pin down what's going to be possible. It's possible that there's some devices that's just not going to be possible to support White Rabbit on. Uh, we'll see. Um, I guess I guess you might need to draw a line at the at the level of precision as well, right? You might be able to support White Rabbit, but if you can only get like you know a couple hundred picoseconds, I mean, I guess it's better than nothing. But you know, that's similar to uh, PTP performance. Um, so taking a look at a couple of the other considerations here. Um, one thing that I want to do with White Rabbit is not say only support it at one gig, but basically to support it at as many link rates as possible. Um, and we've done some work in Corundum to support um, dynamic switching between 10 gig and 25 gig. And I've been thinking about how to extend that to support uh, 100 gig and one gig. Um, so it'd be great if we can support White Rabbit at, at all those different rates. Um, like like I said, for the hard logic, um, that's going to require case by case analysis and characterization. So even if we can, you know, dynamically configure to 100 gig CMAC um, or to 100 gig using the CMAC, I don't know necessarily if that's going to work properly. Um, 
with White Rabbit or not. That kind of remains to be seen. With the SoftMac and the GTH GTY transceivers, it should be doable doable for 10 gig and 25 gig, but um, adding support for one gig could potentially be a little bit more complex. I got uh, some details on the next slide of uh, some thoughts along those lines. And then for the Stratix 10 devices with the H and L tiles, I think that should be pretty straightforward because I actually have enough PLLs to concurrently uh, run parts at one gig, 10 gig, and 25 gig. With the Xilinx parts, there's you know potentially not enough PLLs to support all that on the same quad. But with the Intel parts, it seems like that might be possible. Um, but obviously, you need to investigate latency and all the other um, aspects of the uh, of the tiles to make sure that that's actually going to work. And with the E tile and F tile, hard logic or you know bypassed and just using the serializers, um, I'm not sure about that. I need to take a closer look at the documentation to see what uh, what the story is there. Um, and then I guess also, you know, PAM4 stuff, I'm not sure about that either. I uh, haven't taken a look at that yet, like the GTM devices on some of the newer Xilinx parts. Um, not sure. And Versal, also, no idea. <laughs> Need to take a look at those. I don't have any Versal parts, so that uh, that does complicate that at the moment. Um, but yeah, so one gig on the GTH and GTY parts, this has been kind of a, something that I've been mulling over for a while to try and figure out, you know, how this might work because I think most of the boards right now uh, that Chronum supports are using, you know, GTH and GTY parts. So um, are using parts that have GTH and GTY transceivers. So with the GTH and GTY, they have one CPLL per channel and two PLLs per quad. And for 10 gig and 25 gig, you need one QPLL for 10 gig and one QPLL for 25 gig, which means that you only have a CPLL left, left over for one gig. Um, on boards that support 25 gig. Now, if we don't support 25 gig, then that potentially means we can use a, a QPLL for one gig, which would make sense where possible. Um, but like on the um, the White Rabbit hardware that uh, I'm or on the the card that I'm working on for the uh, Open Compute project, that uses one of the QPLLs for PCIe. So that kind of complicates things a little bit there. But uh, the, the, the problem with the CPLL is that they saved a couple of transistors, so it doesn't have enough divider settings to support all of the possible reference clocks. So the CPLL is only usable for gigabit per second um, traffic when the ref clock is set for, to 156.25 megahertz, which is the case on some boards, but there's a lot of stuff that uses 161 or 322, uh, and in that case, the CPLL would not, not be usable. Um, for one gigabit per second. So I've been thinking about possible alternatives. And one idea I had a while ago was to oversample. Um, basically, you leave the transceiver configured for 10 gig, but then you oversample the 1.25. Um, the problem is the ratio is, well, the ratio is it's not too bad, but it's not great. So it's 8.25. So you end up accumulating an extra quarter of a, a 10 gig UI um, for every bit at... Um, at one gigabit per second. So on the transmit side, it's probably going to work okay with a little bit of deterministic jitter, but I don't know about um, the receive direction. It's unclear how the CDR is going to work. Um, and I guess one thing to think about here is that while you might be able to send and receive data, it's a different story to actually get the clock to lock well enough for White Rabbit to work. So um, this is definitely going to require some investigation. Uh, one option, possibly, um, is to put the, the channel in CDR hold and then just do the CDR effectively in soft logic by barrel shifting and tracking the edges that way. Um, but another thing that's apparently an option, uh, although I need to investigate this a little bit more thoroughly, is to override the CDR logic um, and then adjust the RX phase interpolator tap directly via the DRP port. Um, and this could maybe provide um, something more usable for White Rabbit um, just by effectively in implementing or closing the loop, closing the CDR loop in soft logic. So we'll see about that. Um, we'll, I'll, I'll definitely need to evaluate latency and whatnot to figure out what's what's going to work here and, and what isn't. Um, yeah. 
this is uh, probably a bit of a longer term project to get all this stuff sorted out. But I think supporting one gig is, is quite important for White Rabbit because a lot of the existing White Rabbit hardware is all one gig. Um, yeah, so we'll see. This is something I'm going to be chipping away at. Um, and then the other aspect is uh, is board support, right? Obviously, it's one thing if the, the FPGA supports White Rabbit, but the other question is, does the board level clocking actually support what White Rabbit needs? So White Rabbit, it needs a tunable Ethernet reference clock and a helper clock with a small offset for DDMTD. The original White Rabbit hardware, um, they went, you know, totally all out and put down two VCOs and two DACs uh, to drive those VCOs to provide these two clocks. Um, but it seems like the helper clock can potentially be generated by using internal PLLs on the uh, on the FPGA, where you can. This is a couple different ways of doing that, um, but yeah, it seems like it might not be necessary to actually have two uh, tunable external inputs. Um, so if we can eliminate one, that's a significant step, because the other thing is that a lot of boards actually have fractional N PLLs or uh, digitally controllable oscillators on them already. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about things like the SI570 uh, I2C programmable oscillator or the SI5341 or similar PLL chip with the fractional dividers uh, with the PPB resolution. Um, and that's pretty cool because there's actually, like I said, a lot of boards that have some of these parts on there. So I did a, a quick summary of all of the or a quick survey of all of the boards that Corundum currently supports. And basically the board clocking configurations fall into more or less three different categories. Uh, the first one, these are boards with, shall we say, an insufficiently tunable oscillator. So all these boards, either they have a fixed oscillator providing the reference clock, or they have an integer N PLL that doesn't have enough resolution. I think they're all fixed except for the Sumi that has an integer NPLL, and the best that thing can do is a step size of like 6 ppm or something, which is way too big. Um, so yeah, none of these can support White Rabbit using the uh, the board clocking network. Um, maybe there's some tricks that can be played. Um, I know the Missing Link Electronics guys had a presentation at uh, at the at the workshop about um, trying to use other internal FPGA resources to support White Rabbit on a couple different boards. Uh, so we might be able to use the same techniques here. Uh, we'll see. Um, but then that brings me to the second category. These are boards that have tunable oscillators, but the tunable oscillator sits behind a board level microcontroller. Um, so the board level microcontroller is going to have to, you're going to have to have some sort of path through that firmware. Some of the firmwares might support that already. Some of them might need to be modified. So I don't know if we need to talk to the board manufacturers to get them to modify the firmware, or if we'd have to make the corundum version of the BMC firmware, perhaps, for some of these boards. I'm not sure. Um, but all of these boards, they technically have a clocking network that supports White Rabbit. They just don't have a direct connection to the FPGA. So all these boards, we'd have to take them one at a time and figure out um, you know, how to actually tune the oscillator on there. If that doesn't work, then potentially we can just treat it as the first category and, you know, use some other internal technique, um, which may or not be possible. We'll see. Um, and then the third category, these are boards that have a directly connected tunable oscillator. So all of these are basically ready to support White Rabbit. All we need to do is get the White Rabbit working, you know, in the gateware right, on the FPGA, and then all of these boards, they have either an SI570 that's connected to the FPGA, or they have, um, you know, the, the fractal and PLL chips that are connected to the FPGA. So the interesting thing you'll note is this has, like, most of the Alveo boards, except for the U280 and the U45N, most of the other Xilinx dev boards. Um, so potentially, I, I know with the, the White Rabbit... Um, uh, workshop, there were a few people asking about, you know, we need more reference designs for White Rabbit. Well, if we can get this working in Corundum, this will provide a whole bunch of, uh, of reference designs, basically, for White Rabbit. So um, that's a pretty promising, a uh, pretty promising thing. Um, right. So I guess I mentioned this briefly here. For boards without tunable PLLs, it's possible that there's some internal features that can be 
abused to tune the transmit frequency with the required uh, resolution. So uh, the Missing Link Electronics guys were looking at the uh, MMCMs and QPLLs, and I think they actually, they had an SI570 on one of their boards that they tuned to offset it slightly because I think the, the QPLLs, they can only tune in one direction. They can only tune down, I think. So they had to tune the uh, uh, the the SI570 up. But I'm like, well, okay, if you got to tune the SI570, then you might as well just tune the SI570. <laughs> um, so there might be a different technique that, that would make sense here. Um, I was almost thinking what you could do is use some combination of the QPLLs and the TX phase interpolators. With the QPLLs, you can add an offset, and then the, with the phase interpolators, you could remove it again, and then you can tune one of them, possibly. For the Intel devices, there seems to be some support for fractional uh, dividers. Um, I'm not sure how to tune that necessarily. And I'm also not sure if they have like a, a phase interpolator or if the um, if the QPLLs are not <laughs> if the PLLs are not QPLs on Intel devices if the PLLs can tune in both directions with the fractional divider. Um, not sure. I also need to figure out how to adjust that because they don't really have much of a register listing, so that could require some reverse engineering, perhaps. Um, it's a more difficult, more difficult thing to do, um, but. It's not necessary if the, the board level clocking supports it. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll have to take those uh, those one at a time. And I'm not sure about, you know, some of the, you know, E tile and F tile stuff. Um, if, you know, doing something internal is gonna be possible or if the only option is using the board level clocking. Not sure. Um, right, another thing that we got to figure out as well is dealing with the multiple you know, PCS and PMA clocks, because all these different link rates, they run with all sorts of different clock frequencies internally. Um, with the original White Rabbit switch, the whole shebang basically ran in the same clock domain, all 125 megahertz. Um, and that made things a lot easier. Um, but if you have multiple ports running at different link rates, um, then you have to be able to transfer time between not so nicely related uh, clocks. Um, and with very high uh, precision. So a lot of this, there, there's definitely gonna be some uh, design stuff that has to be figured out here. So one gig, uh, we're gonna be running at 125 megahertz. That's pretty straightforward. 100 gig CMAX, those run at 322. Uh, for 10 gig and 25 gig, I think what we're gonna have to do is run those with the, um, with the, the synchronous gearbox, which runs at either 161 or 402 megahertz, depending on the uh, the link rate. Um, and then, yeah, we'll have to have some, one of these clock frequencies will probably be used for basically the, uh, the time reference for everything. And then we'll have to transfer timing from whatever frequency that is, probably 161, but it could be board dependent to all of these uh, internal frequencies. So I know that uh, the folks at CERN did some work with DDMTD to try to get it to... Um, relate two clocks that are, well, not unrelated, but related by a, you know, a rational fraction. Um, so that could be a, uh, that could certainly be a decent option to look at using that. But if you have two different clock frequencies, I guess there's a question of, you know, how exactly do you measure a phase difference between the two very precisely? Because, you know, you, any two edges are, you know, you're going to have, you um, you can't really define the phase offset as nicely as if they are the same frequency. So there's a few things I kind of need to get my head wrapped around in terms of um, making this work. Um, yeah, and then we have to be able to transfer the, the reference times across the clock domains with, you know, picosecond resolution. So that's probably going to involve, you know, using DDMTD to measure the, the delay and then compensate for that. And then also like the PCIe clock is running is totally unrelated, right? All the all the Ethernet stuff ideally would be sourced from the same oscillator, so everything should be rational fractions, but PCIe is is different. Um, and then I guess another question is, you know, should the core clock be derived from the Ethernet reference clock instead of from PCIe? This is something that I've been mulling over um, as another potential change to Corundum. Um, and that is. Um, basically decoupling the core clock from the PCIe clock. Uh, and that could allow us to do a few things, right? One of them, we could run the, run the core clock faster or slower, depending on, um, you know, timing requirements. 
I know on some devices there can be timing closure issues and you have to run, you know, particular, and we've had to drop stuff down to like PCIe Gen 2 instead of Gen 3 just to get things to close timing. So that could provide a another knob that we can play with. And it could also make some of the time references more accurate. Um, if everything is synchronous, right, all derived from the same clock, you know, it'll make providing a high resolution clock to the user logic shall we say, possible. <clears throat> um, yeah, so this is this is stuff that I've been mulling over here. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Other clocking considerations, we need the helper clock, right, uh, with a small offset. And the offset, I'm trying to remember what it is off the top of my head. It's usually something like n over n plus 1 times the uh, times the, the main reference clock, where n could be like 1,000 or you know, two to the 16 or something like that. Um, so I was taking a look at possible ways of doing that. My original idea was to use, you know, the internal PLLs to um, basically try to get divider values and multiplier values that are, I guess, maybe relatively prime. I don't know, something where you can get a, um, where when you stack them up, you'll end up with a really small offset. And, and you do it right, you'll end up with a really small offset. So that looked reasonably promising, but then the uh, apparently I completely missed the phase shift capability of the MMCMs on the Xilinx devices. Um, and uh, the MLE guys were trying to use that for uh, for basically building a phase locked loop around um, the MMCM. So what I realized is that, well, actually for generating this helper clock, you might be able to just build a little state machine to drive the uh, the phase shift logic to generate a, a fixed, very small offset. So I'll have to do some some head scratching on that front because that could make uh, could make things a lot simpler for generating this this helper clock. Um, and I think we should be able to use the same technique for both the uh, Xilinx devices as well as at least Stratix Ten because they also have this this uh, internal phase shift uh, capability in their uh, internal PLLs. Um, but I guess there's a question of, you know, how is this going to work for DDMTD uh, in terms of jitter and whatnot? So definitely going to involve some uh, some exploration here to see what's what's going to work and uh, what isn't going to work. Um, and then another thing that I was trying to figure out is with White Rabbit, it's very sensitive to place and route. So every time you run the whole tool chain flow to generate a new bit file, um, to get the maximum accuracy at a white rabbit, you have to go recalibrate it. Now, I'm not sure exactly how much the timing changes, um, but sounds like potentially hundreds of picoseconds. Uh, so for the white rabbit switch, every time they release a new firmware version, they have to go through a big, long, complicated process of, um, of calibrating it and producing, I guess, some sort of calibration parameters that uh, correspond to that firmware. So when you load the firmware on the device, you not only have the FPGA image, you also have all of the calibration parameters. Um, so I was thinking, okay, if we're gonna integrate White Rabbit into Corundum, this would make things kind of complicated if you wanna drop customized logic on top. It's one thing to provide potentially a, a pre-calibrated image of the whole design, but if you wanna put user logic in there, you know, you don't want to have to necessarily recalibrate that. So it was making me wonder if maybe there's a way to um, basically separate off the part that needs to be calibrated from the rest of the logic, uh, potentially using either partial reconfiguration or some kind of you know logic lock, uh, placement lock sort of thing, where that component can be placed and routed first um, and tested and evaluated and then you can drop a, a user logic design on top of it uh, later. And the other thing that would be useful as well is um, potentially for some of the larger devices, there can be issues if it takes too long to load the design from Flash. Um, there can be problems with the PCIe link utilization or link enumeration. So it might make sense to, you know, support, you know, kind of the tandem from support um, at the same time. So basically we can have sort of an outer shell which just has the timing critical ethernet stuff and the PCIe logic, and then everything else becomes a, a user logic design that can be dropped in. Um, still requires some thought because 
I, I've not really done much with partial reconfiguration because it adds a lot of additional logistical complexities, but potentially uh, this could be a good option for saving the calibration overhead. Um, we'll see. Um, another thing that I discovered recently, I was taking a look just at, you know, how do existing NICs do synchronous Ethernet? Uh, Linux apparently has a, a DPLL subsystem for um, basically supporting synchronous Ethernet. And I'm not sure exactly what else it might be used for, but the idea is you can, you know, select different reference clock inputs, uh, which could be recovered clocks from different ports, uh, and use that for um, for synchronous Ethernet. Um, unfortunately, this is a very new subsystem. It was only added in kernel 6.7 and the latest LTS is 6.6. .6. So uh, we'll see. Um, but this could potentially be uh, useful for White Rabbit, at least in terms of getting the, you know, the syntonization uh, selected, right? You can pick the, the reference clock input that you want. And then from that point, then the hardware can take care of, um, you know, the, the PTP side of things and the, you know, fine timing adjustments and fine timing measurement. Not 100% sure at this point, but I guess what I was also thinking for the roadmap is it probably makes sense to add support for Sinky and then White Rabbit because, you know, Sinky is basically White Rabbit, but without the uh, the really high precision delay measurements and such, right? White Rabbit just basically adds that on top of Sinky. So um, it makes sense to figure out how existing NICs are doing that and connect that to Linux. If we implement that in Corundum, that's going to be a good stepping stone, I think. So I don't know when this is going to end up in an LTS release. Hopefully in the next few months, then this could be a good platform to build on top of. I also need to take a look at what other NICs are doing. I think it was the um, the Mellanox Connect X6 DX devices that can support uh, this mode of operation. Fortunately, I have a couple of those NICs, although... They make a couple different versions. Some of them have timing I.O. and some of them don't. The ones that I have don't have timing I.O. But I don't know if that makes a difference for um, White Rabbit support. Or not White Rabbit, for um, Sinky support. Um, right, so that brings me down to basically the end of all of this. <laughs> um, the, uh, the status. Um, basically, I'm trying to work on, at a high level, figuring out what all the pieces are going to be, how they're going to fit together, what all of the... Um, potential pitfalls might be, or maybe not all of them, but what some of the potential pitfalls might be. Um, and obviously there's a lot of little nitty gritty that needs to be sorted out. Um, and we're probably going to need to get the board level management core integrated to control clocking. And I guess that actually might bring me back a little bit to the system Verilog integration, because I think there are potentially some nice system Verilog RISC V cores that uh, could be worthy of consideration. And if the whole design is system Verilog, it makes it a lot easier to use those. Um, and also, this is something that I mentioned at, um, at, at the workshop at CERN, but I guess I haven't talked about it here yet, is that I've been working with, um, the folks at the Open Compute Project to basically make a, um, a White Rabbit NIC, and the idea is to use Corundum for the NIC part, and then add White Rabbit, and hopefully PTM on top of that, um, and we put together a little custom carrier board for the Korea K26 system on module. And like the week before going to Geneva, I got uh, Corundum running on this. Um, and this uses one of the Renesis uh, PLL chips, not a Silicon Labs one. Uh, that was changed at the last minute. Um, but the eventual goal here is to support uh, White Rabbit and PTM. So it should have uh, all of the hardware components necessary to support uh, White Rabbit. Um, yeah, so that should be that should be good once we actually get all of the uh, all of the kinks worked out. We're gonna have to do at least one more hardware revision because there were some some issues with the layout. But you know that's how things work. Um, I think that's about all I got for today. I also I put a couple other slides in here um, for the PTP time distribution subsystem. Um, not really too important to talk about because I talked about this you know either. I guess a couple of months ago, probably, but I put together a slide for the presentation at uh, at CERN, so I figured I would put it in here just in case people want to take a look at it. Um, that's about all I got in terms of the uh, the status updates. Like I said, not much technical stuff in terms of progress, but there's a lot of odds and ends um, 
to take a look at in terms of White Rabbit and then also the, uh, the license and language changes that I'm mulling over. So if anyone has, has any questions or comments or stuff you want to discuss, fire away. And um, also if anybody is, uh, you know, watching the recording uh, afterwards, it would be great if you have anything you want to discuss to bring it up on the on the Zulip or on the mailing list, uh, particularly in terms of the languages and licenses stuff. Very nice presentation, Alex. A lot yeah, of details paying more than into the compared with the workshop of term. Right, yeah, yeah. It's a lot of stuff that I was so... thinking about when I was in Geneva, but uh, you know, with only a 15 minute presentation yeah. slot, <laughs> <Good laughs> you can't really go into too much detail. <laughs> sure. Right. Well, I just realized that somebody posted a uh, message in here asking about what are the possible applications of White Rabbit. Um well, I, there was a bunch of stuff that was discussed at the uh, at the White Rabbit uh, workshop. So um, at CERN, they're using it for their accelerator control systems, right? Because they have to synchronize stuff to, you know, fractions of a nanosecond, right? Because they got to get the, the particle beams to be in the right place at the right time. And those are moving at the speed of light. So yeah, you got to be pretty accurate for that. Um, I It seemed like there's... There's applications for all sorts of other physics experiments. You know, other accelerators can take advantage of it. There's uh, the workshop we heard from another group that's, um, or another accelerator that's being built in Germany, I think, that's using White Rabbit for, for the control system for that. Um, there were also like some radio telescopes uh, that use White Rabbit for synchronization. Um, I think there was some other internet infrastructure people that are looking at using white rabbit for you know higher precision time synchronization just through the existing you know dark fiber basically um let's see uh, there's also some i guess financial applications as well when, whenever you're doing the high frequency trading it's very important to be able to monitor what's going on uh, at least for auditing purposes <laughs> with very high accuracy timestamps. Uh, just to make sure that uh, you know what order things happened in, because um, that can be a problem in some cases. So White Rabbit means you can do that more accurately. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. Is somebody going to say something? I know that uh, a lot of uh, industrial people ask for it, like just you know, uh, asking about it and what's in what in in which aspect it's better from uh, P the regular PTP and uh, all of that. They, I mean, I think they was, they have the mind of uh, if we can do better, at least we have some margin, yeah. more margin, you know. So yeah. if, uh, so th there are uh, so generally when we explain that it will cost much more due to the you know the the PLL precision or of that they they um, they get back a little bit but <laughs> it depends sometimes yes and some some they say that uh, you know if uh, if they can be ahead of time a little bit on this maybe when later the 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 the, the card and the the hardware will get more commonized uh, more common right you know uh then they'll be they'll already have the capability yeah, yeah exactly that's uh, that's more like this right. and uh, uh today i'm working uh, on a, a big french company uh, for a bunch uh, big french company who who runs uh, and launch uh, satellites mm -hmm. you know for gps and all of that and so that's very interesting for them too right right oh i guess there was there were there was at least one company at um at the white rabbit uh workshop that was that also does similar stuff with uh with i guess maybe not gps but um you know that type of the gnss <laughs> like yeah, the, the GNSS, european version sure. and whatnot and because yeah, those systems it's, uh, all it's need to be galileo. monitored um yeah, it, so it's called galileo in in europe so the system 
Right. Yeah. I mean, it seems like there's several different systems right now. Like the U.S. Yeah. has GPS, uh, yeah. Europe has Galileo, and then uh, China has their Beidou, I think, system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is it just three, or if, is there another one? There might be more. Oh, you know, I, Russia you, you has have their to, uh, GLONASS. Yeah, Russia. Yeah. You have the GLONASS stuff. Yeah. And I think maybe there's, there there has maybe, been. Yeah. So there's also some stuff augmenting GPS as well. I know there are yeah. some satellites that transmit various augmentation signals. It's not really exactly. part of the positioning itself, but that'll augment GPS or whatever uh, to improve positioning accuracy. Yeah, um, Actually, everybody has a good reason to augment GPS and change a little bit of stuff. Uh, one for the, uh, you know, plane traffic for precision approach. Right. Uh, yeah, so some, some for... Um, you know, tr uh, tracking of containers that are left on the sea because they fall out of boats and uh, that oh, kind really? of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, didn't know yeah. That. That's interesting. <laughs> you thought they, yeah. I, I thought they would sink quickly enough before uh, you'd be able to figure yeah, that out. Yeah, maybe okay. uh, sometimes hmm. yes, but at least if they can send their, their position before sinking, they can uh, pinpoint it and uh, and get it back later, or at least uh, you know. Uh, record their position for later on, or th that's what, what I mean. I guess, do. I guess it really depends on what's in the container, right? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, <laughs> right? It's like once it falls, if you have a container full of iPhones and it falls off the ship, you know, okay, yeah, <laughs> never mind, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, uh, but That'll you be know, a lot of water really... damage warranty claims, <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's uh, also for, um, you know, for um, pollution and all of that, so they can know. Uh, more precisely, I know that uh, for the planes also, they want to put a lot of uh, uh, precision GPS tracking device in all parts of uh, the plane, you know, so that uh, in the engine, in the tail and all of that, so that if there is a damage in flight, uh, they cannot lose a plane like they did on the Malaysia one a few years ago hmm. uh, th th that kind of thing that they are thinking about all of that uh, and uh, we are working on on that kind of application yeah I mean I guess a lot of that stuff is not so much about having an augmented positioning system but being able to have some uh, some other form of communication right because sure. all these GNSS systems are all one way they just transmit um, so, you know, if you want to put a tracking device on something, it has to be able to send its position through some other communication Absolutely. Channel. So so it means also that you have to transmit at relatively low power to avoid, um, you know, um, jamming everybody. And so... Uh, and the satellite kind of has thing, to be able have... to peel all those apart somehow. Exactly. So th that's used with uh, SDR stuff and all of that. So... Um, uh so the, the the precision of the clock and the and the precision of the capture uh basically what you get is a big pile of noise and uh, you, ca <laughs> you you you're trying to make sense of the noise as best as you can so you have to have a, um you know precision device that sync on a on a, on the descendant uh, f a clock face and um <laughs> uh, and then the, the 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 data sent back from the device are sent, you know, away, and then you're with some coding inside so that you can recognize it in the noise. Well, mm -hmm. so I, I don't. I, I'm working on the network part, so I don't understand uh, all of the, the what they are saying in the in the on the RF side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah on the RF side, sure. So I don't understand everything but i try to summary here right yeah yeah i've heard that they're, they're also trying to extend like adsb coverage over the ocean as well because right now that's kind of a dead zone because the planes will transmit their position by adsb periodically so over the over land there's lots yeah. of receivers that'll pick that up but over sure. the ocean um there isn't mm. much so i guess there's there's some satellites that are also now featuring ADSB receivers, so they have some coverage over you know where stuff is over the ocean. Again, to you know, if something like MH yeah. MH three seventy happens, okay, then they might have an idea of where the thing yeah. ended up. But the problem is also that the satellites that are picking up these transmissions they are orbiting at a low low orbit, 
so they also have to have a, a good positioning them, uh, uh, themselves to be able to uh, you know triangulate exactly what it comes from and all of that so yeah it's difficult stuff but anyway we are we've been asked uh, a lot of about uh, uh, white rabbit and uh, this kind of technologies and wh especially what it what it add as a constraint on uh, on the clocks and uh, on the PLL and all of that and the choice of comp electronic components maybe not to do it today but to be able to do it in the future if needed right 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 yeah no it's like there's a lot of stuff that you need for uh, for white rabbit to work yeah so the other thing you know is being able to talk to that some of the white rabbit folks it uh, starts to make sense how complicated uh, white rabbit needs to be if you just think about it for for a nanosecond right how how long is a nanosecond fiber right it's yeah, like 15 yeah, exactly. or 20 centimeters or something like that that's a nanosecond right so if you want to go down to even 10 picoseconds right you divide that by 100 we're talking like a millimeter right so if you actually want to time sync to that level you need to have you need to characterize the asymmetry of your fiber to you know the millimeter level um so that's not possible if you have multiple fibers this is not feasible sure. to do that so for white rabbit they have to use one fiber uh okay. with the bidirectional modules um okay and then the bidirectional modules you know they transmit and receive at different wavelengths for the different directions and the different wavelengths propagate at different speeds so you know okay well that's something you can characterize, which is good, you know, different fibers and different transceivers. Um, but then as the, as the transceiver temperature changes, the wavelength changes. As the receive power level changes, the delay changes. It's like, oh, so <laughs> the um, they need a lot of software looking at all this stuff and calibration tables and whatnot um, to actually make the whole thing work at that level of, uh, of precision. So, yeah, I mean, it's... It's one thing to work at, at one gig, as I guess they've done a lot of work to characterize transceivers and stuff at one gig, but you know, 10 gig, 25 gig, 100 gig, I mean, I think it yeah. kind of remains to be seen. Um, yeah, I understand. You know, what's going to be possible and what isn't. And I've also just been thinking, okay, so if you have to do it over a single fiber, you know, what, um, what other modules are available? So I know you can get, you know, bidirectional modules at, um, at 10 gig. Um, Yep. But bidirectional yeah. modules at 100 gig, I guess they have they have like multi-mode bidirectional ones, but I don't know if I've seen single-mode bidirectional. It's usually um, usually you're just limited to something like um, the CWDM modules, where yeah. you know it's 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 using just two fibers and different wavelengths, but it's two fibers. We we need one. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, I don't know. You um, really re need only one, right? That's it. Right, yeah, that that's the idea is, is you get it down to one fiber because because if you have two fibers, then the fibers can be different lengths, right? And if they're yeah. off by even a few millimeters, then yeah. Yeah. your okay. your timing is off by a few picoseconds, right? And mm -hmm. that's um, you know, when you're talking about time synchronizing to a few picoseconds, that that becomes a problem. So, um, yeah, it's like I guess you could make it work with 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 uh, two fibers, but you'd have to have a way of um basically measuring the length of both of those fibers to within a fraction of a millimeter. And that's uh, that's not so yeah. easy to do. So, so yeah, I'm not sure, I'm not sure the best solution for that. Um, and then I guess, so at least for the stuff they're doing at CERN, they just have, you know, individual fibers connecting stuff. Um, but if you're talking about, you know, over the wide area network, they might be using like DWDM connections where you might actually have, you know, a couple of fibers that then end up getting merged into one or something. It's, um, I wasn't necessarily clear how some of the wide area yep. stuff worked. But you have I don't think they issue. use multiple directions on the same fiber for that sort of thing. So, mm. yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, running at different wavelengths is not that big of a deal because you can figure out what the... Uh, what the dispersion is of the fiber and, and from that figure out. Um, I found some, but I think you have to put some money on the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's usually how it works around here. Let me take a look at <laughs> those really quick. Because, yeah, on BX, yeah. A BX. Oh, that's interesting. B okay. BX is a single fiber in. Uh... 
Oh yeah, it's kind of yeah. Thing, hmm. Okay, that's hmm. interesting. Oh, so I guess you need two. So <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> you need two chance? different uh, two different cross compatible modules. Um, yeah. Unless you're Google, I've I heard that the uh, the optical switches that Google is uh, using in their latest network actually use um they use the same frequencies for transmit and receive. You know, so it's WDM, mm. and then they use a circulator. Uh, so their switch needs really, really good um, uh, return oh. loss. <laughs> Otherwise, everything gets screwed up. I imagine up. so. Yeah. Um, doing something like that for White Rabbit, I guess it would work, but ey, that would be a pain. Okay, yeah. so that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, so I guess these are single wavelength. Yeah, okay. Um, or not single wavelength, single fiber. Um, single hmm. fiber, two wavelengths. And the, yeah, so the I guess... Wide. Right. So this now, I guess, raises the question of, you know, how you run White Rabbit over this, because this thing is going to have a, a, a phi chip in it, presumably, which is converting uh, 4 by 25 NRZ to uh, single lane CAM4 at uh, 56 mm. gigabaud. So, yeah. yeah. I'm not aware of, yeah, there are some other kind of modules. Yeah, but I'm not sure they're able to do single fiber. Right, yeah. That, that's what they call SFPDD, uh, which is a, a SFP a regular format. Oh, the DD, okay. Yeah, um, the, it's, a, it's a new for, a format, it, it looks like, but I'm not sure. There's a couple of Xilinx networks that have those, but they seem to be relatively uncommon. Yeah. It's a double it's density, low, so it's got it, the it, it's got the longer tab on it, and it's got uh, exactly. two lanes for transmit and, and it's low distance. It's two uh, between five hundred uh, five uh, five hundred meters and ten kilometers, and it's on duplex, so it doesn't fit uh, the, the pre requirement. Well, I mean SFPDD, so. you can probably get a bunch of different optics in there. That's just yeah. a form factor. Sure. Um, but that's for fifty gig and a hundred gig, presumably, yeah. right? Fifty gig is yeah. two by twenty five, or hundred gig is in two by 25 gigabyte PAM4 or 50 gigabit PAM4. Yeah. Yeah, I guess with the, so I have some, somewhere I have some DR1 modules, which are, I guess, a similar idea to the ones that you sent. They, they use two fibers, but it's uh, one one wavelength per fiber as opposed oh, to CWDM4, yeah. which is four. Um, Absolutely. But yeah, I guess, yeah, I'm not sure what the story is with the delay going through these, because as soon as you start putting a bunch of digital logic in there doing goodness knows what, <laughs> it then becomes a question of uh, what that's going to do to, you know, if you're trying to do precision timing with White Rabbit, you know, how does that work? Um, yeah. That brings me to uh, something we use on the, sat uh, on the satellite itself, which is, uh, I don't know if you heard about uh, 10G Baz uh, KR, which is... Um, yeah. Uh, a 10G with uh, an additional with FEC on it. Yeah. yeah. The fire code FEC, I think they call it. It's a 20, I think, yeah. It's It's a not 50... RS FEC. It's a different FEC. No, it's not the RS FEC. It's, uh, well, I, at least the one I'm using is uh, the 74 uh, version right. of the FEC, which is simpler. And uh, I know that for 25 gigabits, there is a RS FEC as well, which exists. On the KR right. Yeah, mode. yeah. It's like it's like all the twenty-five gig per lane stuff adds to RS FEC. Um, okay. The ten gig per lane stuff, I yeah, I think it's just it's a, a fire code FEC. I think it's supported for both uh, ten gig and forty gig. Um, hmm. Yeah, probably. But yeah, I, I've not done too much with FEC. Okay. Um, I guess FEC increases the latency, but it doesn't necessarily increase the variance of the latency. Um, now that's the problem with White Rabbit, right? Latency you can compensate for that, but variable latency, yeah. you have to be able to, you know, either measure it somehow or, you know, control it yeah. somehow, one or the other. If you can't do either of those, then it directly affects the synchronization capability of uh, of White Rabbit. Um, okay. Because apparently that was a problem with some of the transceivers. I think I can't remember which FPGA they were talking about or which transceiver, but uh, basically they just have a routine that resets the transceiver until they get the latency they want. Uh, so okay. it's kind of like roulette. Okay, let's see what we get this time. Nope, all right, let's <laughs> see what we get this time <laughs> until they finally get the the uh, the correct latency. Then it's like, okay, now we can run. Um, uh, but yeah, the more complicated the thing is, um, well, I guess mm -hmm. at least in that case, they could probably measure the latency somehow based on the relationship of a couple different clocks or something. But uh, yeah, how you would handle like some proprietary phi chip in an external transceiver 
Yeah, yeah I don't I know. Agree. I don't know. But yeah, we okay, have to, that's we interesting. We have to buy one and uh, unscrew one uh, and open it. Uh, open it, but at two thousand euros, it's a kind of uh, a pain to do that. <laughs> right. Well, so I mean, so that's interesting because I have some uh, some DR1 transceivers that I got for like stupidly cheap, uh, which mm -hmm. I, are basically the same thing except they use two different fibers. Right. It has the the, okay. the phi layer, uh, the PCS chip in there, which takes the the four by twenty five and converts it to uh, single channel uh, thirteen ten um, with PAM four. So I okay. don't know if they're doing stuff with FEC or whatever. What I what I do know is that it takes a good couple of seconds <laughs> for the link <laughs> to come up <laughs> yeah, through those sure. things. So um, I mean that's not we're not switching at the moment, so that's not really a problem. But that definitely implies that there's a lot of um, funny business going on in there. Uh, which mm. could potentially be a problem. So, yeah, not sure. The kind of thing where, okay, at, at surface level, all right, it doesn't seem too bad to support White Rabbit, but okay, when you get down to it and you actually want to get this thing running with a, you know, a high level of uh, precision, okay, well, how do you do that? Hmm, that's when yeah. things get more complicated. So, yeah, not 100% sure at this point how that's, uh, that's going to pan out, but, you know. Okay. Um, okay. Important stuff to think about, yeah. And I guess the, the bidirectional modules at 40 gig also use two fibers. Um, hmm. But they use two they use two wavelengths on, on each uh, each fiber. So the fun thing about the, the 40 gig modules, or the 40 gig and 100 gig modules, is um, you don't need to get two different ones. <laughs> because... Um, Basically, the way the wavelengths work out, each half sort of acts like yeah. you know one end. So, yeah, I need to get a couple of those. I just recently got, I just recently got a couple of the um, SWDM4 modules, which is basically the same as the CWDM4 except at 850. That's not going to focus, is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, HPE uh, QSFP28 SWDM4. I haven't had a chance to test them out yet, but um, yeah. Just uh, it's for monomode other... fiber, or it's yeah, that's for, for that's for a duplex multimode fiber. Um, I okay, figured something like that might be a little bit better. You know, this optical okay. switch I have here is multimode, so it's like okay, okay. if I'm going to use that switch, then it makes sense to use these um, because you can actually just connect any input to any output, and it'll work. Sure. Versus the the uh, the bidirectional ones, where since you're using mm. both directions on each fiber, you got to keep them paired up. So yeah, sure. So I got to take a look at that one. Um, I have the DR ones. I guess maybe it would make sense to try to get access to some of those other um, bidirectional modules. I don't know. It might. I'm thinking for the time being, it's probably going to make sense to stick with the single lane stuff. So maybe some bidirectional yeah. 10 gig and 25 gig modules. Well, we'll talk to the guys at CERN and see uh, if they have some stuff that uh, they might be able to provide. Not sure, because that's one aspect to get it working. It's another aspect to calibrate it. Um, and I think yeah. they might have they might have done some pretty fancy stuff to calibrate some of their uh, modules. I'm not sure what that process was, or if, if they calibrated them, or if they had the manufacturer calibrate them, or whatever. That was actually one of the... That came up at one of the talks at the White Rabbit Workshop, is um, adding some... Adding a reservation to the EEPROM in the modules for storing calibration data for, you know, precision mm. delay calibration. Uh, and then that way okay. the manufacturer could calibrate it and dump that in the, in the table. And then, you know, the white rabbit core would just read that out. Um, so I don't know at the moment who was doing that calibration. If it's, uh, if it's manufacturers that are doing it, if it's some third party or if it's, you know, falls on whoever the end user is to figure out how to calibrate it. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, okay. I mean, I guess as this stuff becomes, you know, more adopted, then you're going to see more support for at the conceiver vendor level or whatever for calibrating some of this stuff. So I think there's some other um, protocols that might be able to take advantage of some of this higher precision uh, delay information. Not sure off the top of my head, though. 
they discussed a little bit in the uh, in the presentation that there were some other entities that were interested in that information, but I can't remember what what it was off the top of my head. All the presentations are online at the White Rabbit site, if uh, at the workshop site. So if people wanted to go over that and take a look at some of this stuff. Um, I'll see if I can hunt down the link real quick here. Yeah, I was I was looking at this earlier, trying to find a particular presentation. Oh, right, because the other thing that I'm thinking I probably need to do is get some, you know, time interval measurement capability for just making sure stuff actually um, is working the way we're expecting it to work. Okay, yeah, so all of the... Uh, all of the presentations and stuff are available there. That's just linked from the 2024 White Rabbit Workshop page. Um, so yeah, you can click on any of those, and they should have all of the uh, all of the presentations attached. At least the powerpoints. I they 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 recorded everything, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah I, in, if you click in one of the of the items. In... You have the PowerPoint, the PDF, also the recording link. Yeah, I didn't see the recording link, but maybe uh, I need to take a closer look at. If this. you go, for example, to yours, maybe... okay. I just clicked on the Light Rabbit button, and I didn't see anything uh, related to the recording. So, oh, okay. That's like the the third one. Yeah. Okay, for some reason, materials. mine has a recording button, but I clicked on the. Uh... <laughs> The uh, the light rabbit talk from from um, uh, from the missing link electronics folks and it didn't <laughs> say anything about that I didn't see a recording link there so maybe they're um, just kind of slowly uploading stuff. It's possible. Yeah, interesting. Okay, now now I'm seeing recording links on on all of them. All right, let me take a look. Where did this so the one I, I clicked on the light rabbit one and I didn't see the link. Did they like skip that one or something? <laughs> Yeah, that's weird. So the one that I clicked on doesn't have the link. That's funny. <laughs> the missing link electronics guys getting the short end of the stick. Yeah, they're probably <laughs> probably uploading those piece by piece. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I guess it's important that they have mine up because the missing link electronics guys had to leave early, so now they can watch it. <laughs> or maybe they can just watch uh, this talk, which has way more detail than that one. Anyway, yeah, important stuff to think about in terms of trying to get White Rabbit operational. Yeah, well, piece by piece, hopefully we'll uh, hopefully we'll make it work. Yeah, I've been planning on kind of working from the the FPGA side out because I think there's at least being able to support Sinky and whatnot um, is potentially going to be useful, and we can use some of the White Rabbit components to do that, even if we're not doing the picosecond precision timing transfer, but just being able to, you know, take any incoming uh, receive recovered clock and then frequency lock everything to that. So we'll see. It's going to be a while before all that works. Anyway, anyone else have any uh, questions or comments or stuff you want to discuss? Not from my side. All right. Fine with me. Oh, I guess one thing, I, I put this board up on my camera, but I guess maybe with the presentation up, you couldn't really see it. This is the um, the board that the open hardware folks have uh, put together uh, with the Korea K26 system on module. So it's got okay. three SFPs. The, the top two are, are 10 gig uh, capable wired to GTH conceivers. And this bottom okay. one is... Um, wired to the LVDS IO and there's a couple of SMA connectors for um timing related stuff. It's got um two lanes of PCI Express on the edge connector. Um the reason we're doing that is because this uh the chip on here only has one GT quad so we got to split it between ethernet and PCIe. 
Um, we have some connectors on here to where you should be able to run this thing standalone, right? As opposed to as a PCIe add-in board. And then on the back, you know, we can see a couple of the um, modifications that I had to make to get it operational. Uh, and this also has an onboard USB JTAG with the rather interesting vertical uh, USB-C connector to take up less space on the bracket. So there's some uh, there's some nice design features here. I think after another revision and then getting the capabilities integrated into Corundum, it could be a pretty useful little board. Um, and then I guess what the um, OCP folks are going to do is release the board design. In fact, I think you can probably already download this board design from GitHub, although I don't recommend fabbing it because it has some problems. <laughs> but the uh, subsequent revision should fix a lot of that. So, And then I guess similar to the time card, presumably you'll be able to buy them from various uh, vendors. And yeah, like I said, uh, Corundum does currently run on here at uh, 10 gigabits per second through the, the top two modules. So um, I got to get it running it. I got to see if I can get the, the one gig module running. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go from there. All right. So that's about all I got. I guess if nobody else has any questions or comments, then uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Thank thanks you very much. In. It was very informative. Yeah, thanks a lot. All right. Sounds good. Talk to you guys later. Yeah. See Thank you. you very much. See ya. Bye.